Working Cows Podcast, episode 372. This episode is brought to you by C90 Ocean Minerals. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. This is Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast, recorded exclusively in the Understanding Egg Studios. And I'm very excited to welcome back as an advertiser to the Working Cows podcast, C90 Ocean Minerals. C90 Ocean Minerals, the leading mineral and trace element sea salt for your herd, is now available nationwide at Tractor Supply Company. We're excited to bring the incredible benefits of our mineral-rich sea salt to more farmers and ranchers across the country. To find your closest tractor supply location, visit us at c-90.com slash tractor today. Trouble with flies? Select stores also carry C90 mineral salt with garlic for fly control. Learn more today at c-90.com slash tractor. Very excited to be joined once again by Dallas Mount. Dallas is, of course, the CEO of Ranch Management Consultants, and they are the uh, fine purveyors of the Ranching for Profit School and the Executive Link program, among other things. And uh, we're going to talk to him today as he's been owning a business now after spending many years telling ranchers to run their ranches like a business. Now, he's been in the driver's seat of a business for a number of years, and we're going to talk to him about some of the things that have helped him uh, as he's been guiding this business, some of the uh, lingo, some of the ways of thinking about things, the mindsets, and the way that they think about uh, the different opportunities uh, available to them and analyze them and, and some of the things that have helped him just lead that business all the more better. So, Dallas, thanks for joining me again on the Working Cows podcast. Welcome back. Thanks, Clay. Always fun to be with you. Yeah, we're just continuing to to blow Brian Alexander's number of times on the Working Cows podcast out of the water. So I was thinking about that the other day. I probably should have him back on because he's he's probably getting a little a little jealous. But uh... <laughs> it's always fun to beat Brian Alexander at something. At you something. Know? Yeah, I can't beat him in the beard department. That's for dang sure. <laughs> <laughs> Me either. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things, uh, ranching reboot podcast, by the way, shout out to Brian Alexander. Uh, I, uh, one of the things that, you know, actually what inspired it is as I was preparing to be on, uh, Jared Sorensen's profitable regeneration, uh, profitable stewardship podcast. Um, I, I was listening to you on there and you were mentioning some things uh, on there that have been kind of helpful as you have been managing uh, ranch management consultants. And, you know, just some of those ideas of, you know, now you've been teaching ranchers to look at their ranches as a business for all these years, right? Even back to your time with extension and, uh, you know, some of that. So you've been teaching ranchers this for a long time, but now you are also a business owner and making some of those decisions that affect your own personal bottom line as a business owner. And I was just kind of wondering, how has that changed your perspective on the way you teach? Has it, has it changed anything significantly uh, in the way that you teach these things? Some of those things. So that's kind of where I'd like to go for this. So I guess we'll just start there. What has changed or has it changed anything being in this business owner role for the last couple of years? Yeah, cool. Good, good question, Clay. Well, thanks. Um, uh, boy, I it, it it's changed it, and it and it hasn't changed it, right? I mean, I've I've been teaching this stuff for for twenty years. But looking back to my university time, I I think what it's done is it it's allowed me to to understand the when you're walking the walk as well as talking the 
talk is different, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and when I when I and, and I'm, I don't mean in this in derogatory terms against people that that are employees, but when I was an employee with the University of Wyoming, right, I I would go out and teach rancher stuff, and I would get a paycheck whether I was good or whether I wasn't good, right? I mean, you know, if if I was was terrible at doing my job, I probably would have got about the same paycheck as as the fact that I was pretty good at doing my job. When when you're when you're stepping out on your own and you're you're making your own way in the world, I think there's a there's another level of that where okay, now it's you know it's my own money on the line. It you know if if this thing's going to work or this thing is not going to work, it's it's going to be highly dependent upon my abilities as a business owner, as a business leader, to to structure and run this thing in a way that that works right. And and so I think it became these things that we talk about became a lot more real, right? When it, when at the end of the day, it's, it's me having to make sure I, I develop my own paycheck. Right. And the, and also the people that depend on, depend on us and depend on me. So um, yeah, I think they, it's, you know, the things we talk about are largely the same, but I think I can talk about them now with, Hey, this is what we do. Right. And not just, Oh, I read this in a book or heard this is a good idea, right? Uh, which is probably where I was coming from ten years ago, right? You know, and it, it's that idea of the difference between signing the front of the check and the back of the check. You know, yeah. when you go from being the guy who's just signing the back of the check to the guy who's now signing the front of the checks, multiple checks, and there's other people whose livelihoods depend on you and and your ability to continue to see the way forward with this business. It, it just some things have to change, right? It's not right or yeah. wrong. It's just you've got to approach things differently now, right? Right, right. Yeah, no, that's 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 exactly. And I'll I'll tell you a little story that I've been telling at Ranch. So some people probably probably heard me say this, but um, you know when I when I first bought RMC, I liked doing individual ranch consults, and you know I'd get a lot of phone calls of you know Hey Dallas, can you come out to the place for a couple of days? Let's let's work through my economics, right? Let, can you have, and I'd say, sure, let's, let's look at the calendar. Let's pick a date, you know, and it's probably a ranch that would mean a day's worth of time, a day's worth of travel time to get there, you know, two days on site and then a day worth of travel time home. Right. So it was a, it was a four day commitment and, and people would say, okay, well, what do you get charged for something like this? You know, and I'd kind of look around and say, well, you know, heck, here's, here's what the other people are charging. So, I mean, let's, let's pick a number, you know, $1,500 a day or something like that. Right. So, so that I, I'd, I'd go, I'd spend four days and I'd send the folks a bill for 3000 bucks. Right. If I was there for two days, um, well, one of the things I did when I bought this company is I looked at my overhead costs of keeping the doors open uh, and ranch management consultants, right? So if we took our our salaries for the, everybody that works here, you know, keeping the lights on in the building, the building rent, right? Uh, uh, my obligations to to Dave uh, to to meet to meet what I owed him for purchasing the company. So so these are the costs just just to keep the lights on before we actually do any work. And if I took the number of working days in a year. And divided into that. So, so let's say I can't remember what the number was when I bought the company, but let's say it was four hundred thousand dollars, right? And then let's look at the number of working days in a year, which, which is pretty is close not to three hundred and sixty-five days. It's not three sixty-five, <laughs> right? Yeah, everybody else is thinking, yeah, three sixty-five. No, let's look at the number of working days if you're a reasonable person. All right. <laughs> so, you know, if you take figure weekends and some holidays and some time off, right? Two fifty is a pretty close number to use, right? So. Um, four hundred thousand divided by two hundred and fifty. Uh, I mean, if it were two hundred working days in the year, the math's easy, right? Two right. two thousand dollars a day. Um, and, and now you know my number was maybe you know seventeen fifty something like that, whatever it was. Mm-hmm. You know that would kind of slap me across the face, right? Look, if it's my job as a leader in my business to structure our business, that you know every day. We're producing more than that in margin, mm. right? You know, so I mean that that's a that's a pretty big big slap in the face. So, you know, these things that I enjoy doing that that feel like they're really good at creating value. I mean, you know, fifteen hundred dollars a day, heck, that's good wages. But when you've chosen to structure a company, I mean, I've chosen to buy RMC, right? I've chosen to structure a company that has this level of overheads. I've that by doing that, I've now got to focus my time on creating things that actually move the needle. Right. And, and I see a lot of people who we work with ranches 
ranches, right? I mean, what what are the what you look at most ranches? What what's their daily burn rate, right? How much money do they go through a day? And a lot of ranches, it's two to three thousand dollars a day. Is if you take the total amount of money leaving the business divided by even three sixty five, right? There's and and so it's your job as leader of your business to structure it so that you you know that that business is creating significant value every day. Right. And I think so many times we get caught up in the, you know, oh, I'm going to save a hundred bucks by doing this. Well, you know, slap yourself across the face. Right. Because a hundred bucks isn't going to move the deal. But, you know, it's your it's your job to create significant value in your business. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And th- and those things kind of change over time, too. Right. I mean, as as things progress, as things grow, uh, as a business matures, maybe uh, those things are going to change what that ratio looks like is that true in your experience absolutely i i like to think there's so most of us in in ag and you know that that are kind of entrepreneurial by nature that want to build something right we we start off early in life and early you know maybe in your 20s you know, what what you have is you have your ability to get out there and hustle right and to, and to physically work and to physically do it right and and that set of skills takes you so far Right. But then there is a point where those skills can only take you this far. And in order for your business to grow or, you know, depending on what you want to do, I mean, maybe, maybe some people are very happy just having a very simple life. Right. And and there's nothing wrong with that at all. But a lot of the people that we talk with want to build something that's bigger than themselves. Right. Want to build something that can involve others, that can, that can grow, that continue to. If that's what you want, then at some point that that strategy of hustling, working in it, I can do it all myself. I can figure out how to fix this stuff, right? Um, that strategy will only take you so far. And then you have to adapt and change, right? And that and that's a very hard thing to do. That that was very hard for me. I'm I'm frugal by nature. And if I can do something myself instead of hiring somebody to do it, that was always my default. Right. You know, I mean, you just think about things around the house and, you, you know, things with your vehicle and things outside. Right. When when something breaks, it was my nature to, OK, I'm going to figure out how to fix this. Right. I'm not going to take it to town and pay somebody to do it. I'm going to save, you know, a thousand bucks by fixing this myself, even if it takes me a week. Right. Well, you know, that that'll help you when you're starting out and you're broke. But at some point, you've got to change that philosophy if you want to turn this thing into something that's that's bigger than yourself and and that's a that's been a hard adjustment for me that's you know it's it goes against my my natural nature and um you know goes against my propensity to be frugal <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah um, well and I, there's i've had to be intentional so. a, a couple of different things to think about there that i think kind of help frame this is like if a billionaire stops collecting interest on his wealth for the amount of time it takes to him to bend over and pick up a hundred dollar bill, he loses money. Right. Yeah. Or yeah. to put it maybe another way, that's a little bit easier to understand. If, if I need to dr- generate $2,000 a day and we're just, let's say a 10, 10 hour working day, that's $200 an hour. So if I spend time working on a lawnmower rather than just taking it to somebody who can fix it, even if they're going to charge me a hundred bucks an hour to fix it. If I spend four hours working on that, you know, there's 800 bucks <laughs> when it would have cost me $200 to have him fix it. You know, some of these yeah, perspectives yeah. I think are helpful ways to think about these things. Yeah. Yep. I, I, I think it is too. Now, I mean, anybody that knows me knows I like to spend time working on stuff. Right. And I, I think we have to be intentional though, is, is, is that time recreation or is that time, actually time taking away from doing the higher the higher value jobs in your business right like I, I like to come into the office early in the morning I like to be thoughtful get that stuff done and you know oftentimes in the afternoon you'll find me out tinkering with a project or something and and to me that's recreation right mm-hmm. I'm I'm it's kind of that escape it's kind of those things so um you know but if my business wasn't being successful right somebody should be slapping me around saying, you know, what are you out here screwing off for, you know, get yourself, <laughs> let's go figure out how to, how to fix this thing. Right. <laughs> yeah. And you've intentionally, so. you've intentionally surrounded yourself with people who do do that. That's their job, right. Is to, to look at the business and say, Hey, what's up here. Right. I mean, that yeah. you've got that board in place for that 
for that purpose. Yes. Yes, we we get outside perspective into our business every year. Yep. yep. And there'll be links in the show notes page today, of course, to uh, Dallas's previous episodes. But on that topic of having outside eyes on your business, specifically check out the one on the Executive Link program, because that's what that program is basically for, is to give ranchers the opportunity to have those kinds of relationships where somebody's looking at your business with unbiased eyes and trying to help you make better decisions. So go check that out in the show notes page for today, for sure. And we'll continue on here on this discussion and, and just talk about, you know, you mentioned overheads. And overheads are always going to be one of the pre- predominant challenges for ranch businesses, in, in as I understand it. Is that is that right from your perspective? Yeah, it is. When we, we look at, you know, we get to see hundreds of, of ranch books, accounts every year and and get a look into those and, and kind of see okay where where the problems lie it's it's very common for ranches to have way too many overheads uh, for the amount of gross product that, that they're producing so we call that the overhead ratio you know relative to the amount of gross product for, for people that aren't familiar with our lingo gross product is similar in some ways to gross revenue uh, but it, it pushes together cash income and inventory adjustments right so um, you know in, in traditional business they're going to say okay you've got this much gross revenue how much of that is going to service the the fixed cost of your business so it's it's a similar ratio that we're talking about so in a lot of the ranch businesses we work with overheads are just eating up those businesses right and and many of it, it we get ourselves in these situations right because oftentimes we're running multi-generational businesses in agriculture and and as a generation as, as management tends to mature I'm trying to put this politely, right? <laughs> we we start surrounding ourselves with things that make the work easier and more comfortable, right? And and oftentimes that means adding additional overheads, right? Uh, the I mean the perfect example is the cabbed four wheel drive tractor instead of sitting in the old open cab piece of junk that we used when we were broke, right? <laughs> um, and so then we take this business that's now, you know, a mature business that's got a high amount of overheads. And now we hand it to the next generation and say, okay, here's this mature business with enormous amounts of overheads. And by the way, you have to buy the land from me or your siblings and, you know, it's your turn to run it. Right. And so we often have these uh, very bloated businesses that are, that are trying to be run by the next generation. And so, you know, oftentimes the way it needs to look for that next generation is very different from the way it was handed to them. Right. They've got to do some restructuring on that to, to make it successful. But um but yeah, if you're picking on me and kind of how how we've run our business um, too is is that's been a struggle for me. Right, I've been preaching, you know, keep it lean, low overheads, and all these kind of things. And and as I look at RMC and and what we've been doing and the way we've been growing, I've been adding overheads. Right, we've been growing our our people here, our core core group. Uh, we moved to a new larger office building, you know, to to house those folks. Right, and we've got all these things that come with creating this overhead business. So it's uh it you know you're preaching this and then you're acting in this way but uh right but we're very cognizant of looking at balancing that that amount of of gross revenue and and overhead structure and Jordan and I will, will talk about this quite often we'll sit down and strategize and say okay well what happens if like it it's a fear for us, you know when this cattle market turns around um, most people are coming to ranching for profit with what they feel is disposable income, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, when when this cattle market turns around, or is everybody going to be real tight, right? And, and all of a sudden, enrollments are going to drop, uh, you know, down to okay. What what do we look like as a business if that happens, right? How do we how do we make those adjustments? And so we're we have those kind of conversations and strategize, but uh, uh, and it gives me some peace of mind when we run through. Okay, here's here's the plan. But what does a worst case scenario look like and how do we how do we manage that with our current overheads? Let's take a quick break and hear a word from our sponsor today, C90 Ocean Minerals. C90 Ocean Minerals, the leading mineral and trace element sea salt for your herd, is now available nationwide at Tractor Supply Company. We're excited to bring the incredible benefits of our mineral-rich sea salt to more farmers and ranchers across the country. To find your closest tractor supply location, visit us at c-90.com slash tractor today. 
Trouble with flies? Select stores also carry C90 mineral salt with garlic for fly control. Learn more today at c-90.com slash tractor. Yeah, and so how do you think about the hiring piece of that then when you're looking at uh, this from the business owner's perspective and some of those things, thinking about hiring new people, when to bring them on, bring them on before you need them, uh, you know, kind of how do you time the hiring with the growth of the business? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And I'm going to just put this out there. I I don't know that I have this right. Um, you know, we're we're doing the best that we know how to do and and, and we're trying to be thoughtful in how we do it. But I think there's um, uh, arguments to say maybe that what I'm doing is not the right way to go. So um, with that being said, with, with the bias, um, we're, we're trying to be early. Um, we're trying to hire before we're in a crisis state. Um, one of the things is, as we look at what we do, it, it takes a year, year and a half half to two years to to uh, get somebody a part of our team and and then develop them to the point that they can be uh, teaching ranching for profit schools, uh, you know, and leading those by themselves. So um, it's not like we can just flip a switch and and bring somebody on. And then, you know, when things go down, we can't, you know, we, the, when I'm bringing people on, I'm I'm bringing them on with the intent of, hey, you know, you, you come and be a part of this team and, and we're going to have you, you know, you're you're pulling your weight, you're adding contributions, we're not going to leave you high and dry. So, um, so we're, we're making the decision to, to hire before we, we probably absolutely need those folks. Um, and you know, I, I hope that's a good decision as we look down the road. Um, I'd rather be there than be caught on the back foot and, you know, looking at that two year time window to, um, you know, try to get caught up. Um, so I think that's, that's what we need as you know, one of the things that we talk about in class is, is a ratio of gross product per FTE gross product per full-time employee. Um, you know, in the, in the business world, again, they'll look at this as, as gross revenue, uh, divided by the number of people on your team, right? It's kind of the same thing. The The number in the business world that I hear a lot is is uh, half a million dollars, uh, half a million dollars gross revenue per full-time employee. Um, what we teach at Ranching for Profit is um, is $400,000 gross product per FTE. So so they're pretty similar, um, you know, and I, to most ranches out there are probably running somewhere around 125 to 150,000 gross product per full-time employee uh, which is part of the reason why the their overheads are so far out of whack right they they have way more people on the payroll um, than they should relative to the amount of of value that's act, that the business is actually producing right now I, I'm not saying when I say that I'm not saying that those people aren't aren't working hard, right? They are working hard. Most people are probably working too hard, actually, to be honest. There's either the business is too complicated or the business is not good at creating Mm. value, gross product, right? These people are engaged in doing a lot of stuff that's not actually moving the needle. Okay. Yeah. So what, so when, when you look at that, right? Like, let's say, uh, let's say you, you're looking at your books and you're like, wow, I'm only $150,000 $150,000 gross product per FTE, right? I need to fire some people might be your, your thing. Well, actually, could could we make an argument that you that you might actually need to make the problem worse before it gets better, right? And and so what I'm what I'm saying by that is sometimes the solution to actually creating a business that has more gross product is giving up the low value things that you're doing. Right, either stopping doing them altogether, or assign them to somebody else. I.e., maybe hire somebody so that you can be liberated, or or somebody that wants to do that stuff can be liberated to do the high value jobs. Right, it's because what's probably not being done are the or or the the higher value things. You know, the planning, the strategy development, right, the uh, the marketing, right, all, all those kind of things that actually might move that needle for you. So. So that, that's one of the things we look at as, as Ranching for Profit is, you know, okay, how, who can we bring people on to do these things that then would free somebody else in the business up to do to do some of the higher value things? And I know m- many people probably know Jordan, uh, Jordan Steele, who's our director of operations. He's just been an amazing part of the team here the last couple of years. Um, but yeah, when, when we brought him on, I stepped back on some of the things that I was doing day to day. And, and, you know, it allowed me to identify 
and ink some deals for ranching for profit that were significant deals, right? So these are things that I would probably have been too busy to otherwise pursue, right? So just something to think about there. Yeah, for sure. And this is kind of that distinction between Whitby and Watby, right? We're going to hire out the Whitby, give us some time to spend some time on the Watby, right? Exactly. Yeah, yep. yeah. Let's 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 hire out some of those low value things or some of that minutia. And, and I think too often it's overlooked. I, maybe there's a real argument too that we need to stop doing a lot of that stuff, right? There. I mean, obviously there's some things that need to be done, but I think for a lot of farms and ranches, a lot of businesses altogether, we spend a lot of our time doing. I mean, when you step back and look at it, just stupid stuff. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm spending my you know three hours every day, you know, going through emails right? And deleting junk out of my inbox, right? I mean, you know, I, that's an exaggeration for me, of course, but I mean, there, there's everybody has this in their lives, right? There's just minutia. There's just stupid stuff that we're spending our time doing. And by, by having that time devoted to that, we're not using that time to focus on the higher value things. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is spoken of in the book by Tony Morgan called Killing Cockroaches, where he was a city manager and somebody called him into their office to kill a cockroach. And he's like, uh, no, <laughs> this is not my job. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, but I think one, one thing we should probably do before we go too much further is just give a, a quick and dirty definition of overheads. And as I understand it, that's land and labor, right? Or kind of your overheads overheads, land and the things attached to it, labor and the things that help them accomplish their tasks. Is that that's, suffice? That's a great description. Okay. Yeah. Oh, the overheads are, uh, you know, the, the test of an overhead is if I add one more unit of production, does that cost also, uh, d does that cost increase or, do, or does it, is it not tied to those units of production? Right? right. If, you know, if I add one more unit, if that cost goes up by one, then it's the direct cost. Right. If, if it doesn't change, then it's an overhead. Your, your pickup depreciation, your, your pickup doesn't care if you run 200 cows or 400 cows, mm -hmm. it depreciates the same. Right. So that pickup is an overhead, right? Your, your wages as, as a manager, as a key employee, if, you know, we're going to pay you the same, whether you, you know, farm a thousand acres or 1500 acres, right? It, it doesn't matter. So those are all overhead costs. So, so many farms and ranches have been taught to allocate all that stuff, put everything on a, on a cost per bushel, a cost per ton, a cost per calf. And it gives you bad information when you take your overheads and you allocate them out per unit uh, because those overheads don't change as the units change. Now, now at some point, the overheads will either take a big step up or a big step down, right? So when they change, they generally take change by big steps. So, so they need to be looked at separately from the direct cost. Sure. And then one other thing, could you give me an example of a complicated business or a business that's too complicated? You mentioned that when we look at these things, usually it's a sign that a business is too complicated or a sign of something else. Could you give me an example of a business that's too complicated? Oh, man. Um, I, I don't know that I have a, a definition that'll fit on the tip of a pen. <laughs> so here's here's something that we tend to see. The, those businesses that are what we would consider benchmark businesses are the highly successful businesses, the ones that are really, really good. They tend to do one, two, or three things really well and, and at scale, right? So, so a, a I guess a complicated business would probably be something that's trying to do a lot more, more things than that. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, it, here's, here's the example of like a farmer ranch that, that through well-intended decisions, decisions that seem right have created just a complicated mess, right. right. Is okay. We, we were maybe, maybe mom and dad had a cow calf business and, and we were selling calves. Well, you know, when it came down to the fall time and, and I was going to go sell those calves, well, I wasn't getting enough money for those calves and somebody further down the line was making more money. So I'm, so I'm going to keep my calves and I'm going to make yearlings out of them now. Right. And I'm going to, now I'm going to sell eight, nine weight yearlings. Well, when it came time to sell those yearlings, right. Well, somebody down the line is getting money for taking those yearlings to finishers. So I'm going to, I'm going to grass finish my yearlings and sell grass fats. Right. 
Well, then I'll, the the dang Packers getting all the money for the grass. So now I'm going to uh, keep those and I'm going to direct market my meat to somebody else. Well, or to, to my consumers. Now I'm advertising quarters, halves, holes. And, and when I'm delivering these, my clients say, well, I'd, I'd like uh, to just buy a package of ground beef from you. And, and so now I start selling individual cuts that have got freezers and inventory management. And, and now when I'm delivering my beef to my consumers, they say, oh, do you also have chicken? Right. So, or I'd like to buy eggs from you. So now I go home and I start egg mobiles. Right. And, 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 and so pretty soon you, you kind of take this down the line. Right. How many enterprises are going on in my ranch? Well, let's say I've got cow calf, I've got stalker, I've got finishers, I've got um, my meat business, and my meat business has my home raised, it has the stuff I'm brokering in, and now I've got inventory management, I need websites, I need uh, procurement systems, I need freezers, I need trucks, I need somebody to go sit at the farmer's market on Saturday. All right, so now I've got a business that's maybe still only doing a million to $2 million of gross revenue, and I've got... 14 different enterprises layered on it. And when I look at my books at the end of the year, I don't even know where the heck the money's coming from, much less where my costs are occurring. I can't break this thing down into my enterprises, right? And every day I wake up and I've got a million and one things to do on my to-do list. And I don't know which way to start, right? Versus a simple business would be, we do X and we do X and Y, right? That's what we do. Here's our thing. Now, you know, we're going to this year X looks this way. Next year X looks this way. Right. That that's what I mean by a complicated versus a simple business. Yeah, for sure. And I think that it's it's always the temptation. Right. Well, I read a great book or I watched a great YouTube video or I listened to a podcast and now I'm going to change my business or I'm going to add this enterprise. And like you said, one, two or three things really well at scale. And both of those things are important, <laughs> not yeah. just one yeah. or the other. You can't just be at scale or or doing it well. You need to do both. And yeah. that helps yeah. with a Absolutely. lot of those. Now, I mean, let me make a couple of clarifying statements here. I'm not saying don't consider new enterprises. I mean, I, I think every business every year should be sitting down and saying, hey, should we be doing this? Uh, you know, Should we be doing that? Should should we be you know right and and we should be looking at all these things now of of the fourteen good ideas that come up in front of you maybe one of those actually gets pursued right and and of those things right we're going to vet that idea ferociously and we're going to have yeah, I think an important testing question when we look at um, new enterprises is if we're going to do this enterprise it must produce a gross margin of at least you fill in the blank within two or three years, mm -hmm. right? You know, so, I mean, if we're talking a, a $2 million business, that new enterprise better do at least a quarter million dollars within two or three years, right? Or or it's just a distraction. I mean, you know, you don't, it, you know, it would be silly for Ranching for Profit to pursue a new enterprise that produced a $5,000 gross margin. I mean, you know, we're that would just be nice, right? So we need to pursue things that that can actually move the needle, right? So if if you're, you know, if you're a 600 cow ranch, right, selling two beef a year is not going to move the needle for you, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Talk about some of the things that you've learned in experimenting with new projects, new initiatives, uh, some of the things that you guys have started since you took the helm. And uh, am I right? Has it been... Will it be four years in September? Is that right? Let's see. 99, uh, October of 99 is when we bought the company from 19, Dave. Yep. Uh, yeah. October of 19. So five years in October. Five years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So five years in October. So nice. we're, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, man, things are, things are moving quick. The years tick by. Um, Let's see. Uh, I yeah, I, you know that little talk I was just giving about considering new enterprises. We've we've put a lot on the board, um, you know, and we've vetted those things and thrown them against the wall and see what sticks. And and uh, some of them have have stuck nicely, and and others have have died a death in the boardroom or or died a death after trying it once or twice. Right? If you can kill um, it in the boardroom, that's a that's the cheapest place to kill it. <laughs> that's the cheapest place to kill it. Yeah. Um, but I, we, when 
early on when we bought the company, I said, uh, you know, one of my ideas is ranch management consultants. We need to have a consulting arm. And, um, and I, you know, that's the name of our company is ranch management consultants and we don't do consulting. Um, so <laughs> I thought, I thought we needed to do that. And I got some people around me. We built a business model around doing consulting and, uh, we even we even went so far as to approach some people about being on the team for that and and then started to put it out there and uh it was it was not it was, it was not really the the people that were wanting to do it wanted to be very selective about who they worked with the people that were calling in to hire us um, were not the clients that they wanted to work with so it was an you know the awkward conversation of all that so we we just kind of said you know what let's the, the the people who we want to work with, which are the, you know, the ma and pa size family ranches who are, you know, kind of the heartbeat of rural America, um, we couldn't come up with a pricing model that was attractive mm. to those to those people, right? Sure. Our our overheads and our business structure yep. did not allow us to to build something that they felt like they could afford. Right. Um, so so we kind of walked away from that, um, you know, and and uh, that was one of the ones that that died an early death before we spent a lot of money on it. So some of the stuff that's really worked well, um, well, there's, there's a couple of things that really jump off that, that are, that are things we started. Um, one of those is something that just happened last week is the young adult ranching for profit mm-hmm. school. Um, 18 to 25 year olds. Um, we do about uh, two or three of those a year. Um, the, we do one that's hosted in house that uh, we put on. Jordan just taught that last week. With uh, actually, I think we have five instructors that went and taught that. Jordan's the the lead from RMC on it, and uh, man, that is such a cool program. Um, you know, it, it's not a huge needle mover from RMC stake, but man, it it po- ticks a lot of boxes next to our mission, right? I mean, we we feel really good about the work we do when we get a we we get you know thirty to forty to fifty. 18 to 25 year olds together for a week talking about ranching and, you know, how are they going to structure their lives to create the life and the business they want? That's, that's a cool thing for us. So, so that was been a lot of fun. Um, other ones that have, that have really worked well are the um, economic intensives and the succession intensives, right? So when people come to ranching for profit, one of the things they really come to learn is, is how to get better at looking at their numbers, um, you know, running, running their economic, economics, running their finances. Um, you know, they come to the school, they get a taste of that and then, and then they leave and maybe they fall off their skill set on that and, and need some help, maybe a refresher. So what we do is we do a two day, um, you bring your books, uh, we're going to have a small instructor to, to student ratio, and you're going to leave with your economic plan for the coming year. And, uh, those have been, been really well received. We're doing two or three of those a year now, and they always tend to sell out, um, and, uh, and yeah, pe- people feel like they get a lot of value out of that. Uh, yeah. Hey, it's, you know, it's kind of like just, you're going to come in a room and we're going to lock the door and you're going to sit down there and do your numbers and you're going to have help to get them done. And, and you don't walk out of there until you got a plan. <laughs> it's it's kind of the way the class is structured. Yeah. And, and some of the people sitting at my table at the ranching for profit school, when my wife and I went through it, were saying, you know, some of the pressure to not do your numbers according to the ranching for profit model is uh comes from the accountant comes from the banker like they don't these aren't this isn't the way they want to see the numbers so i just i don't go through my numbers twice because i end up doing them the way that they want to see them and so i think that you know there's that there's always that pressure against doing it this way and but the value of approaching it the way that ranching for profit teaches just it just gives you such clear information about how you know what is generating value and what isn't and i think that's that's a really key piece of that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Good. Yeah. So, I, it, it, Kevin Jordan on the team too has helped with that because he speaks accountant, yeah. right? He's a, and, and so he, he kind of helps us bridge that gap. And so he can help folks say, Hey, when you, when you go home to your accountant, this is the language they're speaking here. Here's how our stuff, it can be translated into that language. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Yep. For sure. Um, and, and one of the new things that I think you've got coming up, right is uh a a business kind of the business only stuff from the ranching for profit school in five days and without the ecology did i see that somewhere or was that some kind of dream that i you had did. <laughs> you did yep so so that's that's one of those things that uh we're we're testing this year so um you know talking about having your board i took that to a group 
I'm working with last year and said, Hey, I'm thinking about doing this five day thing. And, and these are people that are very familiar with ranching for profit and they go, no, don't, don't screw it up. It, you know, it's, it's been seven days forever. Seven days works really well. You know, you make all these really cool connections. And then they came back later and said, yeah, I think you should try it. <laughs> right? So, um, so we're going to try it. And, and the idea is that a seven, Seven day ranching for profit school, the, the length of time can be a barrier for some people to think they can come, right? There's, we get a lot of people that say, I just, I can't get away from the ranch for, you know, if you got a day of travel on either side, it's a nine day commitment, right? And, and so what we're going to try to do is, um, not that this, not that the ecology and the grazing stuff is not important. It's very important, but, you know, people don't necessarily need to come ranching for profit to learn how to take care of their soil and how to graze better, right? You can learn that a lot of places. So, so we're going to lighten the, the elements of ecology and lighten the elements of grazing. And we're going to leave everything around economics, finance, human resources, people management, and, and actually probably even dig into some of the stuff even a little deeper and, and do that in a Monday through Friday format um instead of our typical sunday through saturday and uh and so the idea is we're going to do three schools that way this year mm -hmm. uh we've got our phoenix arizona school in december uh we've got um we're going to do one in um, the uk in um uh november and then we'll do one in uh, saskatoon in february and each of those are going to be a five-day format uh, so we're we're going to really zero in on the economics and finance and and those pieces, and then at the end of this year we'll come back and evaluate, and you know we're going to have different instructors at each of those schools and kind of you know have a lot of folks to be able to weigh in and say okay what do we think and and the idea is we're either going to stick with the seven day or we're going to really lean into the five day and probably go all in on that uh, depending on the on the outcome from this coming year. Mm, very cool, very cool. Uh, w let's circle back to this conversation. Uh, about kind of your experience as a business owner and talk about a couple of more things on there. Some of the, some of the uh, phrases, some of the buckets, ideas that have been helpful for you as you have started to examine this business uh, that you are at the helm of. Sure. Yeah. You, you, you just asking me to offer things or you got, yeah, yeah. You, you want to dig I, in? Well, I, I mean, I think you mentioned a couple of things again, back to that, uh, Jared, Jared Sorensen webinar podcast. Uh, you know, that I think you, you talked on there about days of working capital and maybe even mentioned on their debt coverage as well, uh, debt coverage ratios, some of those things. So those are kind of the, a couple of things that I, I still had on my list, uh, to, to talk about. Sure. Yeah. So, so yeah, those, those have been helpful to me and those are elements that are actually new to ranching for profit in the last year and a half. Um, John Haskell's had 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 some great input to us on that. Uh, Jordan's been a, been a leader in bringing this stuff in. So, so these are a couple of financial ratios that uh, are worth examining to see where you're at as a business. Um, and so, but let's take for example the uh, debt coverage ratio. So, uh, we've got a. I'm just going to pick up, make up a fictitious ranch. Somebody's coming to us and they've just sat down and, and ran their economics and, and they're like, Hey, my, my cows are really working, right? My businesses are profitable. I'm, I'm exceeding the benchmarks from a gross margin standpoint. Um, I want to grow this thing. Uh, can I buy the neighbor's place? It's coming up for sale. Right. And so just because your business is economically profitable doesn't necessarily give an indication if you can take on more debt. Right. So one of the things we need to look at is your business's ability to service the debt it's already got. And so we look at debt coverage ratio to answer that De debt coverage ratio essentially says, what's my cash income for the coming year? OK, now, when we talk about a lot of stuff we talk about is economic profit, um, economic profit and cash income can be two different things. Right. So we're going to look at your your cat, your positive cash flow from this coming year and then how much of that goes to service debt right so what what essentially we're saying is um we don't want we we want 150% of income relative to the amount of debt we're servicing right so i essentially i don't want to be at i don't want to be at 100% of my income goes to service debt right if i'm if i'm there then everything has to go just exactly right in order for me to meet my obligation to the bank 
right? So I want to build in some some flex in there. Okay, so so that debt coverage ratio is something that that we examine and look at that really gives you an idea of what kind of position are you in to go take on new debt. Um, how are you at servicing the debt you've already got? So so that that's a really really useful thing. And the one that's probably been more helpful to me as a business owner is this idea of days of working capital. Um, so it, it goes back to that story I was talking about, about what what is your daily burn rate? Um, so if you sit down and figure out your total cash costs to keep the doors open in your ranch for a year and then divide five, that will be your daily burn rate, right? So on average, how much money goes out the door every day? Right now, obviously, there's some for for most ranches that number's higher in the winter, lower in the summer, mm-hmm. right? Because we're generally feed costs go up, you know, a lot of that stuff. But but it's it's useful to have that that day, daily burn rate. And then what we look at is how much working capital do you have now? Working capital is a fancy term for how much money could I get my hands on with about two weeks worth of notice, right? So if if I if I got myself in a jam and I needed to get my hands on cash quickly, how much could I come up with, right? And and so the things we're going to think about is obviously cash in the bank, checking savings balances, but then like grain in the bin, calves that are standing in a grow yard, right? That could be easily sold, right? Stuff like that, right? So so we take those two numbers, your your working capital and your daily burn rate. And that will tell us how many days of working capital you you have on hand, okay? And and that's a really useful number for measuring the stress of the business owner, <laughs> as, as well as as your ability to get yourself out of a jam, right? So maybe there's a market market swing, a drought, maybe there's a fire on the ranch. Right, so uh, maybe there's a death in the family, right? Um, these these kind of things that happen cause chaos in the business. And if you've got working capital, now you've got time to to weather that, right? To to be a little thoughtful about how you go through it. So I'll, I'll give an example from my own business. Um, you, we were talking about it. I bought the company in '99, right? Well, so we had October through February is kind of our main operating season. Uh, Dave was was very thoughtful in how he transitioned the company. He sold me the company at a time when we're getting ready to do work, right? <laughs> so we have income. So by the time I got to February, March, I had I had we had some money in the business, right? Um, I owed Dave my, a, a payment for the business, and I thought about well, maybe I'll make Dave a double payment. Is what I thought about that year. You know, I'd like to knock some of this debt out. What if I just paid Dave twice what I owe him and let's make him a double payment? I decided not to do that. And I put that money in the bank for the company and I, I'm, I'm paying Dave interest for using that money, right? Um, so at the time I thought, well, that's kind of silly to pay interest on money that's in the bank, but I, I think I'd like to have a little bank. Well, what happened in March, <laughs> April, May, <laughs> right? COVID happened. Yeah. And I kept thinking, oh, you know, a couple months, this thing will blow over. We'll be fine. You know, by the time fall rolls around, it's time to do work. We'll be up and going. Well, you guys all know what happened, mm. right? Rural America was delayed and getting COVID. So by the time it rolled around, when our really delivery season started is when COVID was really actually hitting rural mm. America. So we had a a full year of very much in flux, um, you know, about our income stream. And if, first of all, were we even going to be able to do work? Uh, if so, what would that work look like, right? What was that going to be? So I was so thankful that I did not make Dave a double payment mm. that first year because what it did is it gave me time to manage through a, a challenging situation, right? And so so that's just an example of that is that is that days of working capital, how how much do you have on hand to get yourself out of a tight situation? Yeah, no, that's, that is a helpful, uh, helpful one to think about for sure. I appreciate that. Anything else that you've really found indispensable as far as just this transition into business ownership and some of the things that have been real helpful to you? Oh, you know, I, I guess something I'd, I'd like your listeners to think about is, um, and I've been thinking a lot about this too as well. Um, it, it's our job 
as as leaders in our business, as people that are you know in, at that position, to make ourselves irrelevant as soon as possible. <laughs> uh, so you know, it, I, I've got some awesome people that I I have an opportunity that are that are part of this thing, and it's it's really my job as a leader of this business to empower them to step into many of the things that I've been doing, right? And and so you know, how how do we operate? Realize that, right? We're thinking about that here, but um, you know, I think of all the businesses that I look up to that are very successful, right? The it it does not have a leader that's hanging on trying to find relevance for themselves in perpetuity, right? It's, mm. it's generally those people who are who are helping empower and grow others, um, you know, so that they can step into those leadership roles. So, um, so we're we're working on that as a business now. I I still want to be, uh, you know involved in this thing, but I sure don't need to be the, you know, the captain of the ship forever and ever. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, that's something we're thinking about how to do. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, Dallas has always appreciate your time and uh, there'll be links in the show notes page, as I said, to previous episodes, ranchmanagement.com and, and uh, everything else. And people can go there and, and heck even uh, join, join ranch management consultants and going transatlantic with a school in, uh, in the UK. That would be a, an interesting one, I'm sure. That's right. Yeah, they're, they're a lot of fun over there. I imagine some of them are going to be listening to this. So uh, I, they they gave me some um, heck for some of my expressions, and the one they thought was the funniest is when I said "hot dog." <laughs> they they liked that. They were all picking on me the whole time for my funny expression. So uh, it would be fun to have some uh, ranchers from North America go over to the school in the UK, and we can make fun of their bloody expressions. Yeah, right. No, that was I got in trouble when I had Bob Havard on uh for calling his place a ranch. And yeah. uh yeah, no, they're farms. And that has helped me where we see the the English influence kind of wane as we cross the hundredth meridian and we get yeah. into the Spanish influence in the West, they're they're ranches, right? And that's kind of helped right. me figure that out. Oh yeah, that's why that language is different from one place to the next. But yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> well, yeah. Anyways, thank you so much, Dallas. Appreciate your time today. You bet, Clay. I appreciate all you do. Very good stuff there, as always, with Dallas. Really appreciate his uh perspective and just kind of the way that he continues to analyze his experiences and learn from them and grow as a business owner himself and helping others to do the same through the schools and programs that they run there at Ranch Management Consultants. Very excited to be joined next week on the Working Cows podcast by Leanne Fuchs. We've, uh, of course, talked to Eric Fuchs, her husband, before about Soil Health Academy and about uh, all the good work that they are doing. Now we're going to talk to Leanne, Eric's wife, about our approach to human health. She is a chiropractor, among other things, and we're going to talk to her about a more natural approach to uh, human health because, as I understand it, profit isn't worth a whole lot if you're not healthy enough to enjoy it. So we're excited. Looking forward to that episode coming your way real soon on another episode of the Working Cows podcast. We'll see you then. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.